What does it take to grow crops on Ganymede? How would fighting and moving in low gravity be different than here on Earth? And where in the world is Bobby Draper? We're going to talk about that today, so grab your canned chicken and let's do the science on The Expanse, Season 2, Episode 10. This week we got a better view of how the show envisions farming out on Jupiter's moon Ganymede. They grow crops out there to feed folks on Mars and in the belt, likely because Earth is already stressed by the tens of billions who would live there at this point in the future. It's also likely they save a bit by not having to haul the bulk of all that food off of Earth, and having at least a supplementary supply of food off-world would be vital to maintaining life deeper in the solar system. We've seen small hints of this before, with growing walls being used in places like Tycho Station and Ceres. This is most likely just for supplementing air purification as well as aesthetics. Ganymede has that as well as its primary focus on feeding people, so the system's air would be much more aggressive and robust. Obviously, growing crops in space is a much more difficult prospect than here on Earth, not just because of the lack of sunlight in controlled environments, but because it would be very difficult to maintain viable soil off of Earth. There's an anonymous quote I love which is often paraphrased as man owes his existence to six inches of topsoil and the fact that it rains. And this would be no less true in the world of the expanse. Soil isn't just dirt, it's a mulch of lots of different organic matter, clay, particles, minerals, and it's very active with microbes and fungus that work with most plants to create a growing ecosystem. You probably remember diagrams of nutrient cycling of various kinds back in an earth science class, and you wouldn't be able to effectively recreate that the confines of nurseries on Ganymede. So using hydroponics would be the most effective way to reliably grow crops and maintain yields, at least enough to feed people. Hydroponics is a technique for using mineral-rich fluids to deliver nutrients to plant roots directly. Studies over the last few decades in orbit have shown it to be fairly effective for growing some simple plants. We've even seen astronauts on the International Space Station eat salads grown right there on the station. From experiments, we know that some plants actually have a higher yield and faster growth in macrogravity than on Earth. Assuming the advancements that would be made in plant interactions and plant genetics, hydroponics would be a very effective technique for feeding people in the future solar system. The two main techniques we see in the show are called continuous flow and drain sub-irrigation hydroponics. You can see continuous flow systems here, with the tubes feeding these radishes on the wall. That uses a straight wash of nutrient solution over exposed plant roots and works best for plants that can maintain beneficial bacteria in root nodes. The shots of what appears to be traditionally planted crops are likely using some form of drain sub-irrigation or run waste hydroponics that still uses the nutrient fluent but also uses porous gravel to bind in the roots. Ganymede would be an ideal location for this because the surface is about 50-50 silicate rock and water ice. The cascade failure Prax talks about in this episode would be a very real concern in an environment like that. In the plant world, some plants work synergistically with others, with one species giving off waste that another species can use as a nutrient. To scale crop growth, they would chain these systems together so the first system consumes most of the provided nutrients and produces other nutrients for the plants further down the chain. This would be highly efficient but sensitive to disruption, so when Prax discovers the distilled water being fed into the line early in the system, he knows it collapses imminent. I talked in some previous shows about the effects of walking and low gravity, and this is the first episode we see people moving at any length on Ganymede, which is about one-sixth of the gravity of Earth. I like the production decision to show the effects of low gravity in subtle ways, rather than try to create a clumsy approximation of what it would look like in real life. The truth is, none of us really know what it would look like to move around in low gravity of Ganymede, which is just slightly less than that of the moon. We're used to images of astronauts bunny hopping around in archival footage from the Apollo missions, but that movement owes as much to the bulk and lack of mobility of the suits as it does to low gravity of the moon. There are moments when we see astronauts moving around fairly naturally, so it's not entirely clear how movement will be affected other than being obviously lighter and the top speed being less if you wanted to maintain your balance. It's even more unclear because all the characters would be used to moving in low G and compensate for it naturally. 
trying to recreate that on screen would translate to a whole bunch of exaggerated movements that would just distract from any action in the story. I do think they gave a nod to the reality of it though, and we don't see anyone really landing with force or slamming to the ground naturally or moving very quickly. There are a few scenes where Amos is roughing some people up and he tosses them around rather easily. He's a strong guy, but the way it's shown in the show, they don't slam with a lot of weight and I think that's a nod to the 1-6 gravity there would be there. It's also interesting to note that punching people would be much less damaging low gravity than here on Earth. The force of a punch has as much to do with the leverage, balance, and inertia as it does with muscle strength. We can kind of see this on Earth already. If you've ever played ice hockey and gotten into a fight, the punches land much more softly because the force translates into backward movement on your skates. That's why you see hockey players grabbing each other by the jersey as they fight, so they don't just slide away from each other. It would be even more pronounced on the low gravity here when Amos has a go at the con man trying to shake them down for information about the girl they're looking for. In fact, the way it's shot, Amos doesn't really straight up punch people and he holds or pins them against the ground which would be closer to the way it would be for someone who knows how to fight in low gravity. Likely hand-to-hand -hand combat in space wouldn't rely on punching as, it mu as much as it would grappling, locks, and chokeholds. I expect you'd see some kind of new martial art emerge from a combination of wrestling and jiu-jitsu, and I would imagine an untrained person would be almost as much danger to themselves as they would be to the other person. I'd like to read your comments on this though. What do you think hand-to-hand -hand fighting would look like in the future or in low gravity? What about knives or batons in that kind of environment? What would you expect to see a firing gun look like for someone in low gravity where they didn't have as much resistance against a stock? Post your comments below with the hashtag MyTheory to let us know. I look forward to reading your thoughts and to seeing the discussion as it unfolds. Again though, these scenes are about moving the story forward and the urgent danger facing the little girl they're trying to find. So I like that they chose that over getting heavy on the special effects for the scenes. This short shot at the end caught my attention as someone who grew up in the New York City area. It follows Bobby escaping the confines of the Martian government compound somewhere in New York to go see the ocean, which she's never seen being from Mars. After stumbling through the Undercity, she eventually finds her way out to an ocean outlet to get a view of the water and a clear horizon, and it made me wonder what route must she have taken to get there. It might be a bit of production magic, but there's no clear view of the ocean from Manhattan Island. It's unclear where the Martian compound is, but it implies the UN is still over on the east side of Manhattan where the current UN is. We know there's been a significant amount of sea level rise in the show and much of New York exists behind a seawall now. Even so, Manhattan Island is stuck between the Hudson River and the East River, so Bobby must have gotten somewhere out in Brooklyn past Coney Island, which is likely underwater by now, looking south to get an ocean view. Taking this map that shows the coastlines with the kind of extreme sea level rise that we see in the show, I'm guessing the Martian compound is somewhere out by the old Brooklyn Navy Yards and that Bobby made her way across Brooklyn and is somewhere out near Flatbush, which is coastal property by now. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, it would help a lot if you please click the like button below. If you want to catch future episodes, be sure to click the subscribe button and for notifications, click the bell icon next to subscribe to get pop-ups when I post a new show each week. If you think your friends might enjoy the show, please click the share button below and tell them about it on Facebook and Twitter. As always, I'd love to hear your comments on what you heard today, what you enjoyed, if we left something out, and what you have to add. If you've gotten this far, use the hashtag CanChicken and I'll know you've gotten all the way to the end. You can also follow me on Twitter at Streamweaver and leave a comment there. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to your theories this week and as always, stay curious.